Explicit dynamic analysis often handles complex problems that occur in short time with high nonlinearity. So for such simulation problems, what kind of elements are the best fit? In fact, there is no one type of perfect element that suits all explicit dynamic analysis. To choose an appropriate element, we need to know about the benefits and the possible consequences of different element types. This will help us to balance the required computational cost and the expected accuracy we want to achieve. And more importantly, we should be able to identify errors caused by certain element formulations when evaluating results. And also, we need to be aware of possible solutions to eliminate the unwanted behaviors. In this lesson, we'll discuss these topics for several solid element types so that you can make better element choices in explicit dynamic simulations. Now, let's get started. In this lesson, we'll mainly focus on solid elements, that is, 3D elements. Let's start with heterogeneous element, or hex element. It has six quadrilateral faces and eight vertices. If we have eight nodes located on these eight vertices, we say it's a linear or first-order element. On the other hand, if we have an extra middle node on each of the edge, we say it's a quadratic element or second-order element. The presence of middle nodes in an element leads to higher-order shape functions. In finite element, shape functions interpolate the solution between the discrete values obtained at the mesh nodes. To better visualize the order of shape functions, let's have a look at this 1D element. With two nodes on the ends of this 1D element, the shape functions are two straight lines. Now, with a mid node added, the shape function become nonlinear. Higher order shape functions can interpolate the deformation more accurately compared to linear shape functions when the same mesh is used. And for a geometry with curved surfaces and edges, nonlinear elements can represent the geometry better. Also, the convergence rate of high order elements is higher, meaning that the final element results will converge to the accurate solution faster with refined mesh. However, as you can expect, higher order elements are more computationally expensive. In many cases, linear elements with a refined mesh can also lead to satisfying results and at less computational cost. There's another aspect that can affect the behavior or performance of hex element. That is the number of integration points one element has. So what are integration points for? In finite element formulation, we need to integrate values over elements. For example, here, we need to find the integration of equation f over this element area. Doing analytical integration calculation is usually not possible for practical mechanical problems. Instead, numerical integration is employed. To perform numerical integration, we first find values on the integration points, which are discrete locations in the element. Here, we have four integration points for this element area. Then, a weight is assigned to each integration point. Depending upon different integration methods, the locations of the integration points and the weights can be different. One widely used integration method in finite element is Gaussian integration. The last step is to sum up the values with weights to approximate the integration value. This is how an integration calculation transforms to a summation calculation, which is much easier and faster. Instead of using four integration points in this example, how about we just use one integration point? This way, the integration becomes even simpler and of course less accurate. We call this reduced integration. You can see here the surface representing the function f is sketched to be highly nonlinear for the purpose of illustration. In a real finite element application, the equation for integration over one element usually will not be so dramatic. Also, the smaller the element size is, the more accurate the integration will be. For linear hex element, if eight integration points are used in the volume, we call it a linear hex with full integration. If only one integration point is used, we call it a linear hex with reduced integration. In finite element applications, linear hex with reduced integration is usually the first option an engineer will choose 
because obviously it's the most efficient one since it uses the simplest shape function and least number of integration points. With a refined mesh, such setup can lead to accurate results. However, we should always be careful with our glass behavior for such type of element. So what is our glass? It's a numerical error associated with linear hex element with reduced integration. It leads to zero energy response modes that produce no strain and stress. In the deformation result, it creates a collection of hourglass-shaped elements. Let's consider the hourglass problem on the example of a rectangular hex element subjected to a loading that will have a tendency to deform the element into a trapezoidal shape. Since there is no middle node, the edges have to remain straight here. And if there is just one integration point in the middle of the element, this point cannot detect the change of width and height from this deformed shape. We notice that the two dashed lines remain unchanged here. As a result, at this integration point, no stress and strain can be detected, and no strain energy is generated. The element is with excessively flexibility, and basically it leads to a meaningless result. You can find such hourglass or zigzag shape of element behavior in the results if hourglass exists. Let us investigate a simple example of a beam fixed at both ends and subjected to a point load for a duration of 0.01 second. Looking at the total deformation plot, we can see that near the point load area, the elements are in hourglass mode. Note that the deformation plot here is scaled to visualize the hourglass problem. So how to resolve hourglass if it occurs in the simulation? Using hourglass stabilization control is a common solution. This can often be added to the entire model, or it can be selectively applied to specific regions in the model. We can think of hourglass control as a method to add weak springs or dampers to the model that can store energy. At the same time, we should always monitor the hourglass energy added to the system. Because if there is substantial energy added to the system, it indicates that hourglass behavior is severe and the results should not be thought as reliable. For the beam problem we just showed, from the energy summary, we can see that substantial hourglass energy has been added to it here. But it still shows hourglass behavior in the results. This problem here is tailored to exaggerate the hourglass error. In general engineering simulation, we may not see obvious hourglass deformation in results, but we should still check hourglass energy to make sure it's a small percentage of the total energy. Another suggestion is to be attentive to the types of loading applied to the model. In the beam example problem, a point load was used. Loads at discrete point or along edges can initiate hourglass. But also keep in mind that loading can initiate due to contacting bodies, so we might not have control over how the load is applied. Lastly, another method to eliminate our glass is to switch to fully integrated elements. We should use more integration points. We mentioned before, with respect to the calculation of integration, full integration is more accurate compared to reduced integration. In addition, it does not suffer our glass error. So does it mean that full integration elements are always more accurate? Remember that there is no perfect element. In fact, linear hex element with full integration may face shear locking and volumetric locking errors. First of all, about shear locking, it's an overstiff behavior of linear full integration elements with bending dominant deformation. Consider a hex element under pure bending, and let's draw two horizontal lines and two vertical lines to represent the material's fibers passing through the four integration points. In reality, the two horizontal dashed lines will bend, and the angles between the vertical and the horizontal lines should remain 90 degrees, meaning that there is no shear over the cross-section. However, since it's linear element, the edges of the element cannot represent curvature, so the element can only deform to this pattern, where the horizontal lines remain straight, and the angles between the horizontal and vertical lines are not equal to 90 degrees anymore. This means artificial shear deformation is generated, and we call this shear locking. Shear locking leads to wrong displacement, false stresses, and spurious natural frequencies of the structure. Let us check this simple cantilever beam problem. We have the beam fixed at one end, and a force of 1,000 Newton is applied at the other end. 
The problem is solved twice. One is with linear hex element using reduced integration, and the other is linear hex using full integration. And we have a reference solution solved by a much refined model using linear hex with reduced integration. Due to shear locking, we can see that linear hex element with full integration is overly stiff and leads to lower deflection. Upon existence of shear locking, we can consider switch to reduced integration and use hourglass control. Note that hourglass does not always exist for linear reduced integration element, but we do need to carefully track the hourglass energy. Another solution for shear locking is to use second order element with full or reduced integration. Because with middle nodes, the element can better represent the curved edge and therefore generate less artificial shear stress. Also, refining the mesh can be helpful to reduce shear locking. We know that a curved line can be accurately represented by many short straight lines. So when the mesh is more and more refined, the deformation pattern of the linear full integration element becomes closer and closer to the reality. However, remember that smaller element leads to smaller time step size in explicit dynamics, requiring more computational cost, which is something we need to consider in making the decision. The second problem for linear fully integrated element is volumetric locking when material behavior is nearly or fully incompressible. Incompressible material are those materials that do not or almost not have any volume change under deformation. For linear elasticity, this can be described by a Poisson's ratio of 0.5 or nearly 0.5. Rubber-like material is a common incompressible material. Also, for metal plasticity, when the material enters the perfect plastic range, there is no volume change anymore. With full integration, the requirement of constant volume is applied to all the integration points in one element, which leads to overconstraint. Here, let's see what will happen if we use linear fully integrated hex element to solve the Taylor bar impact problem. It simulates a cylindrical bar with a high initial velocity impacting a rigid plate. The bar will experience severe plastic deformation around the impact area. The problem is solved by full integration and reduced integration linear hex element to compare. Now, we're looking at equivalent stress control plot over deformation animation. If we zoom in, we can see that the deformed surfaces and edges are not smooth when full integration linear hex is used. And if we check the unaveraged hydrostatic pressure, we can see that the model with full integration exhibits a checkboard pressure contour, which is a clear sign of volumetric locking. We'll also notice that the pressure magnitudes increase substantially when volumetric locking exists. So for resolving volumetric locking, we can consider use reduced integration with hourglass control. There are other numerical methods that can eliminate volumetric locking behavior. For example, some solvers may solve volumetric and deviatoric deformation separately to avoid the locking problem. For now, we've been talking about hex elements. However, not all geometries can be matched by hex elements. Nowadays, finite element simulation often target on large-scale problems with complex geometries. In these cases, tetrahedral elements become handy. A tacked element has four faces and four vertices. It can be linear with four nodes or quadratic with ten nodes, and can use full integration or reduced integration. Compared to hex element, tacked element is much more conducive to filling in regions of very complex geometries without sacrificing the element quality. However, a tad element is not without its downsides. First of all, you might notice that one regular hexahedron can actually be decomposed to at least six tetrahedra. This means that to mesh the same domain, using tad elements requires much greater number of elements, leading to more computational cost. In addition, in explicit dynamics, we know that the critical time step is dependent on the characteristic length of elements. TED elements usually lead to much smaller time step size, and the solution time may be longer for the same problem with respect to the model meshed with hex elements. This can be seen in a simple example where a block hits a plate. The same geometry is meshed and solved with hex and TED elements respectively. The number of elements for the model meshed with TED element is much larger than the one meshed with hex elements, and the difference in solution time is much larger. 
Also, one should be cautious when linear tet element is used in a model. Because of the nature of the shape functions, linear tet element always obtain constant stress over one element. Therefore, if the mesh is coarse, the model will behave overly stiff. In addition, linear tet element also suffers from shear locking and volumetric locking. If we use linear tet element to solve the Taylor bar impact problem, we can see checkboard mode from the plot of hydrostatic behavior, indicating severe volumetric locking. Due to various of problems in linear tet element, we should be especially careful to rule out numerical errors when using this type of element in simulation. Besides solid elements, there are also shear and beam elements, which are suitable for geometries with a large aspect ratio in dimension. One thing to note is that for shear and beam, element characteristic length is decided by ink plane size, not the thickness. To sum up, hex elements and tet elements are two basic types of solid elements in explicit dynamic analysis. These elements can use linear or nonlinear shear functions and they can use full integration or reduced integration. When choosing an appropriate element type, we need to know the possible drawbacks for certain type of element and evaluate results to identify possible sources of errors. For example, hourglass, shear locking, and volumetric locking. Also, we need to match the domain with computational cost in mind because the element size directly affects the critical time step size in explicit dynamic analysis. I hope that you find this video informative. Don't forget to visit courses.ansys.com to discover more useful courses.